Welcome, uh, Bob uh, Rosier, to our um, interview series. Uh, Bob is a PhD student from the from Valencia, at, uh, a real recognized international expert in the meanwhile and the oral microbiome. Can you just summarize in two or three sentences, very short, the main findings um, which you uh, which you think are important from the last few years of your of your research? Yes, of course. Um, we noticed that nitrates is a molecule that stimulates beneficial bacteria and bacterial mechanisms inside the mouth. So we found that it can be used as a prebiotic su substance to prevent oral disease and nitrate reducing bacteria, the bacteria that use this molecule and lead to the benefits could be used as potential probiotics. Um, quite intriguing and we come back to that because of course as everybody will quickly see this has a lot of potential uh, for applications um, but let's stay a little at the very early days of your career and also of your research and uh, um, it seems that forever you were passionate about the oral microbiome there is a paper in from 2014 where you published uh, together with some colleagues at FU on uh, the, the oral diseases and uh, are we there where we should be yet in terms of understanding the oral diseases and uh, the oral cavity diseases and uh, I guess the answer of course is at that time was certainly not. Can I ask you, I mean you you got your education in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, in Eindhoven, and uh, now you, uh, you are in you are in um, in Spain. How did you discover the oral microbiome as your real passionate thing to study? So, as a student, I had the opportunity to try different things because both my bachelor program as my master program had two internships so four in total of at least five months and the first two were something completely different that was molecular cancer research at a great institute in Amsterdam and I looked at different molecular aspects of cancer cells and then the third internship was focusing on salmonella chemotaxis um, especially the molecular interactions going on there. And there I realized I really liked microbiology. So I guess that was the first step. And in the fourth internship, so the graduation internship of my master's, I went to Philips Research. And I actually went there because I was interested in getting experience at a company, at the R&D department of a company. And the project happened to be oral microbiology. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about it. I always like trying new things and learning about new things. Uh, <clears throat> there at Philips Research, they develop oral care products. So they test them on in vitro oral biofilms. And I started working with them and reading some literature about the oral microbiome. And I, I just got so fascinated about it. Um, I guess mm -hmm. it was the... the the big surprise that these tiny inhabitants in, in our mouth were affecting our health and metabolism. So mm -hmm. that's where it all started. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, kind of a stochastic element. You ended up in this Philips research department and you were introduced to a oral microbiome project and you found, well, that's it. Um, um, you are also familiar with the host microbiome research in more general terms, and many people study it in the gut and in the skin, and so and so. There's different organs where people put their hands on. Why? What's so special in from your point of view, or significant in the oral microbiome? I think it's often neglected. Mm -hmm. So. If you study an animal that has a gut and a mouth, don't forget about the mouth. <laughs> Important <laughs> physiological processes could be happening there. And Most people just study the other end, uh, which is uh, sequence feces. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> also very important for human mm -hmm. health, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I look at it from a human 
perspective, of course, but we swallow a liter of saliva per day that's full of your bacterial products and it does have a big impact on our health. And I think apart from this nitrate story that, that I just shared with you, um, the bacteria convert nitrates into nitrite and then nitrites is converted into nitric oxide in our body with benefits for our blood pressure and, and metabolic benefits. But I think that apart from that story, there are many more things to be discovered. So yeah, I, I would say that that's what I, I like about it. It's very unexplored still. I think it, uh, so that brings me back to your personal career. I think this is a, an excellent point of course to identify areas where not a hundred thousand other labs are already um, um, putting their hands on and studying in depth and that's your niche and you are already in the last few years with your publications and with, with your uh, presentations an, an international recognized expert in the oral microbiome. Um, that's, uh, that's fantastic. However, if I uh, recognize and if I remember right, um, coming back to your personal career, this uh, early exposure to the oral microbiome didn't prevent you to apply to an inter international Max Planck Research School PhD position and in Marburg and a Max Planck in Germany. And uh, so that's the conventional host microbiome, a cockroach, intestinal microbiota research. You, you started to work there in a very nice group and at some point you decided, no, I want to go back to the oral microbiome or how was it? Um, so yeah, after, after my graduation internship that I mentioned before at Philips Research, uh, that was actually in collaboration with a dentistry research center in, in Amsterdam, uh, a well-known one called ACTA, which is also the, the faculty of the, of the university in Amsterdam, the dentistry faculty. And I worked there for a year after my master. And that was also focusing on the oral microbiota and I was really enjoying it, but they couldn't get funding for me for a PhD there. So I wanted to continue with my career and looked for other projects that I found interesting. And as the Max Planck Institute has a great reputation and a great science and a lot of possibilities, I applied there and I was invited to their selection symposium and, and selected for an INPRS grant. And it, it, it was all very, very nice. I, I picked the project with Andreas Brun because I think he's a great and inspiring scientist. And I was pretty fascinated by the symbiosis between cockroaches and termites in their microbiota. But my mind just kept thinking about the oral microbiota. I had already developed some ideas during my the previous two years working with the oral microbiota. Um, and especially this nitrate story, I, I wanted it to explore it really um, badly. So I, I discussed that with Professor Andreas Brun at that time, and he was extremely supportive and recommended me to, to look for a project in uh, the oral microbiota. That was probably the, the most difficult decision I ever made in my career, um, but also the best one, because I ended up doing exactly what I like. Excellent. It's fantastic. And I think it's uh, everybody has his own reasons why he or she is ending up in a certain position. And this is sometimes tough decisions to be to be uh, to be taken. Um, but I realize and I summarize that you start in the Netherlands, you had a move to Germany and now you are in Spain and who knows where you are in five years. So one certain one certainly one point in, uh, in your career is uh, mobility and uh, just uh, taking up opportunities uh, where, where they are. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's great. Um, coming back to your oral microbiome once more, because there is another aspect which I think is intriguing besides that it is an underexplored field. And that is that obviously, and as you have shown us in your lecture right now, Obviously, one can move relatively quickly to a well understood manipulation of the of the oral microbiota by using 
data uh, for, by using observations from your from your studies and uh, so keywords are and probiotics and of course also prebiotics and nutrition um, where do you think is the field right now in terms of manipulating the oral microbiome and where uh, will it be in in five years or in ten years Yes, I think that at the moment there are several really great research groups working with the oral microbiota. It's a, a growing field, I would say. And in the past, we have focused a lot on disease development, at least in human oral microbiology. Uh, so what bacteria are involved in disease development and you know, study individuals with diseases. But the secrets of health may be in individuals that are exposed to stress factors of certain disease, but do not develop the disease. So maybe individuals that consume a lot of sugar, but don't develop dental caries. Uh, what bacteria do they have? And mm -hmm. what properties do their saliva have? Mm -hmm. I think our group is looking into that and other people are also becoming more interested in that. So I think that's going to be a focus of our fields. Mm -hmm. um, we're probably also going to focus more on personalized treatments instead of general treatments mm -hmm. because everybody is different. So everybody's body is different. Mm -hmm. And with mm -hmm. a toothpaste that would work very well for me, I like my perfect toothpaste might not be the same as someone else's um, mm -hmm. perfect toothpaste. Yeah. Can I, can I just interrupt you here and ask, do you know what a healthy oral microbiome is? Mm, the concept of healthy oral microbiota and dysbiosis and obiosis, uh, dysbiosis is an increase in disease-associated species and obiosis is an increase in health-associated species. I think um, it's very difficult to define them because there are so many differences between people. And that's why it's probably always compared to your own baseline composition, um, what, what you can call dysbiosis or obiosis. Yeah, um, so I agree. I think uh, so what maybe is healthy for me is not so healthy. F a, a microbial composition, which is maybe healthy for me, maybe not healthy for you. And it, it's context dependent. So I think it's, yeah, I mean, the future certainly is in personalized individual specific uh, looking at, at patients and, and Persons, but also then uh, giving them recommendations on a personalized basis on their metabolism, on their general composition. The question is to you really is um, how important is technology making the invisible visible? Isn't that the prerequisite for any progress in the fee in your field, in our field? Uh, Mostly, we don't see what we talk about. Uh, you talk about the saliva, but if an ordinary person looks at the sal saliva, saliva, that is pretty boring. It's just a kind of a milky type of fluid, but we know it's much more rich. So, is technology and development of novel technology and access to novel technological platforms, is that an important aspect of your work? I think that's a very important aspect. And with new omics techniques, we're learning so many new things about the oral microbiota. There's so much new data that we cannot even keep track of what exactly all bacteria are doing. You know, the ones that are associated with health and disease that are identified by sequencing techniques. And in the saliva, the metabolomics to see the composition of saliva, those fields are very, growing very rapidly and there's still a lot to discover there but it's changing the field completely of course we go from only associating a limited number of pathogens that we could culture on the lab to finding changes in hundreds of species in different oral diseases and i think now we have to move from these associations to the understanding why they are higher in disease or health, the molecular mechanisms behind there, and, and their potential involvement in, these, um, in disease and health. And all that needs uh, novel technologies, otherwise we are we're stuck in the correlation. Yeah, that, yeah I agree. Uh, you are a role model uh, for many of them. 
Um, may I ask you what, in your view, are key factors for success in your stage of the career? So my PI, Alex Mira, he often says, enjoy the process. And I think that's a really great piece of advice because we're often so focused on producing new data, writing articles, and the big reward is, of course, when publishing a paper, but that doesn't happen every day. So I think it's very important to enjoy work on a daily basis. And for that, a work-life balance is important. So working hard is not a bad thing, but you also need to plan time to clear your mind. And, you know, the activities that I previously mentioned, like exercise or cooking or hiking, whatever, you know, you, you, you use. And, and I think that's important to, to, to be productive and positive. So I would say that that's important for anyone's success on the long term. And also being passionate and curious about what you do. So if there's a molecule or a bacterium that you find interesting, um, look into it when you have the opportunity, because that's how you get to, that's how you can get to new discoveries. So your research uh, certainly has this two aspects, basic, basic research and finding out uh, principles of how it works in microbes and, and host detection. But on the other side, it's very clear that, uh, that uh, the applications are, are already waiting uh, to be developed from your, from your research. So um, what, are, or what would be advantages and uh, the benefits to now moving into the more industrialized uh, world, into corporate, uh, corporate thinking and research departments compared to academic departments? Um, I think that a main reason that people switch to industry is stability. Um, in science, we often go from project to project and not everyone managed to get a fixed senior position um, in the place that they would like. In Spain, this is very relevant. I'm happy living in, in Valencia. <clears throat> and at the moment, I have a research project here but some of my colleagues have moved to other countries or industry for stability. And in general, yeah, that stability, that would be a main advantage for, for a lot of people. There's, um, yeah, there's more money available in industry, obviously, than in academics. And in some countries, this difference is clearer than in others. There is also less freedom in terms of what you can really develop on your own ideas of course and so i think at the end it's a compromise and you have at the end to make a decision but i clearly see the point that what we can offer to the junior investigators is a much less stable and predictable future than what can an industrial partner offer I totally agree with you the freedom we have during research and exploring our own ideas that's uh, of course the big benefits of research and many people that go to industry have a little bit of pain in their heart as well. That's why previously I said um, to, to keep both options open, because in principle, I wouldn't do any industry job. I would like to, do, if, if I ever go into industry, I would really like to focus on the project that I believe in and, you know, prebiotics and probiotics that could be useful and work on the science within within the company that's that that, that i find a suitable position within industry so uh we are now in not normal living in not normal times and uh, the uh question i have always to the junior inv young investigators is how do you do in this pandemic times and following i mean you have to go on there's uh nobody is really waiting for you until you finally find time to return to research. How does the pandemic or how did the pandemic affect you or how did you, which ways did you find to go around and still continue and you're publishing and you're pub you published this year already a lot of things are in bioarchives and so you, you continue to be very productive in difficult times. How do we do that? Um, the timing of the 
pandemic um, actually was started when I had to start writing my thesis. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I had an advantage compared to colleagues who were starting with their experiments on the lab um, because I was just entering into a writing period and we managed to publish some work then. Um, at some point, I did feel pretty locked up inside my house and even inside Valencia because my family lives in other parts. Um, yeah, that was difficult for everybody, of course. And what was helpful were the, the, possi the, the possibilities to communicate with friends and family via video calls, uh, but also professionally meetings on Zoom uh, mm -hmm. really helped to continue certain projects. So I think the, the pandemic brought many terrible things, of course, but one positive thing is that technology at least um, allowed us to keep communicating and meeting. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was very important. Yeah. And yeah, indeed, it was a challenging time. And I think that during those moments, activities to stay positive are very important. Uh, that's a general advice, I would say, for anyone doing a PhD to keep doing things that clear your mind, uh, like exercise or mindfulness, whatever works for you to, to you know, to yeah. enjoy the, the day to day life and stay positive also during challenging, challenging times. Yeah, which um, hopefully at some point are, are getting over. Um, before we coming to an end to this uh, short interview, but um, you are working on an in the, as I see it, in the interface between real basic research, uh, discovering the composition of the microbiome and trying to understand the mechanistic basis behind the interaction with the, with the, with the, the human um, oral tissues. But also there is, a, it's very clear from your work that there is also always an applied aspect behind that because you can use that information and you can make even specific recommendations and many people will wait for that and ask for such recommendations. What should I eat to prevent that and that? Or do we are now finally developing a new probiotic, etc. Question, last question to you. Where do you think you are or where do you tend to go in the next five years in terms of your personal career? Is that, is that the applied sciences or is that the basic research or is that the good parts of both of sides? Or what do you think, Bob? Uh, hopefully the good parts of both, that would be great. At the moment, we're going to start a project with an industrial partner to see if uh, nitrate that's high in certain vegetables, If what happens if we add nitrate and vegetable molecules to oral care products. So that's mm -hmm. going to be a one or two year project for me. I would also like to do a research postdoc abroad for one or several years. Um, that would be my next step, and I kind of want to, to see how it goes, but at the moment I'm keeping both options open, mm -hmm. so I find the idea of having an own research group and working on our research ideas uh, really great, uh, but I also like the applied side, so I, I don't exclude the option of working in at a company as a scientist to you know, develop products that I really believe in, um, that would also be um, an attractive option for me in the future. Yeah, um, I can uh, fully follow that. And I think the, the future is open to you and uh, you have uh, the luxury to, to make your choices then. For that future, we wish you all the very, very best. Uh, thank you very much for sharing some personal views on your career and, and research. Uh, for the members of the Collaborative Research Center here. And uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing this with us. Thank you so much for coming, Bob. Thank you for inviting me, Thomas.